Welcome everyone to this second session of the 2020 McGill Text Policy Colloquium. So we're very, very delighted today to have with us uh, Shrita Prasad Kota. I hand it over to Shrita. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be talking about this topic. This is something that is really close to my heart and it's also actually a part of my doctoral thesis. Um, as Tarsisio kindly introduced, um, while I was in India, that is prior to starting my doctoral studies at uh, Veyu, I was already working on earmark taxes. I'll tell you a little bit about the prior work I had done and then get into what the mandate of today's discussion is set out to be. Um, and I think for that, a good idea would be to just look at this image. Uh, what I have here is two news piece headlines from India and Austria. Some of you may be aware of the Austrian phenomenon of the digital services tax that was recently introduced. A portion of this digital services tax proceeds are earmarked for supporting the transformation of local Austrian media companies. The tax uh, subjects of the Austrian digital services tax, as we will discuss through the course of this discussion, are going to be the large multinational corporations. But interestingly, the proceeds are earmarked for the benefit of their so-called competitors, the local Austrian media companies. So it's an interesting phenomenon. But this is not new, this is not um, something unique. And what we have seen in India is the other news headline here. And as you can see, uh, if you recognize, that's the picture of our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and he's holding a broom and he's signaling this whole um, poster uh, program of his that was called as Clean India. And how was this Clean India program funded? No stories there, but it is also by way of an earmark tax. This was actually a hygiene tax that was levied on all taxable services for a period of two years in the country from 2015 to 2017. And the money was supposed to be set aside for funding Clean India campaign related initiatives. But as you can see from the headline right there, it says the government has been sitting on unutilized money. The word used over here is cess, and this is a unique term that I also haven't come across in any other jurisdictions. I'd be happy to hear from you, uh, from those of you from Canada and otherwise, if you have heard this term earlier. I have read from the Indian context that this has an Irish origin or a UK origin, and it was replaced to mean rate or a special tax as cess in the Indian context, but this is a unique term. So what this initial picture itself shows us is that earmarking is prevalent. And it is existing in developed and developing countries. It may take different forms. It may have different uh, purposes, but it is very much there. So just before I go into this particular uh, talk on earmarking and tax treaties, a little bit about what were the issues that prompted me to work from the Indian perspective in the past. So this very um, levy, which was called as the Clean India Levy, caught my attention way back in 2016. And um, I ended up doing a whole historical study of earmark taxes in India, which I presented at the Tax History Conference at the University of Cambridge in the year 2016 or 2017, now I'm just forgetting. But this was the first piece I had written on earmark taxes. And at that time, I found a lot of interesting things that we had about 40 earmark taxes in India levied all by the federal government. And over a period of time, earmark taxes assumed great importance so much so that at this point of time, about 10% of the union government's federal, that is the federal finances, are actually funded from earmark taxes. And earmark taxes in India typically took the form of indirect taxes. Being indirect in nature, they were quite invisible to most of us. And we didn't even realize that we were contributing to these special kinds of taxes. Uh, accountability was low. There has been problem around uh, communicating what the money has been really spent for and this news piece is really just one of the one of the many stories that has come out even today just about last week we again had a big news piece on uh, a federal uh, tax that the government has supposedly earmarked and not used for the particular purpose so the study was a historical one and showed me why it was very popular in india so i'll just say a little bit about that uh, in the Indian context, the constitution said that if the federal government raised earmark taxes, it need not put them in the divisible pool of resources, so it was not meant to be shared with the state governments. Uh, 
So therefore, this became an interesting and easy way for them to get away with uh, raising finances exclusive for their purpose. Now, this is a peculiarity in India, and therefore, this was the constitutional and fiscal federalism angle in India. Having said that, I also got invited then to make recommendations on the legal and constitutional issues and earmark taxes to the fi uh, 15th Finance Commission. But once I came to where you, again, I discovered that there's a lot of international dimension as well on this, and no one's really done this comprehensive study from the legal side. And therefore, that prompted me to actually work on this very topic for my thesis. Um, so now starting with what we want to discuss this um, uh, during this seminar is, as we can assume that some of us have heard of earmarking while some of us haven't, I would like to take you through the what, how, and why, giving you the background of what earmarking really is, then to connect it with the tax treaty issues, which is the Article 2 issue of double tax conventions, whether earmarked levies then constitute taxes covered under the OECD model convention, and then leaving us with some conclusions on uh, whatever the findings until now have been. So coming back to this, this very image shows us that Austria chose to earmark for a kind of business purpose, while India chose to earmark for a social purpose. You see that the Indian government used the word cess. The Austrian government doesn't have any new terminology when it used an earmark tax. It just called it the digital services tax. And interestingly, in the Austrian situation, only 15 million of the total collection is earmarked. While in the Indian scenario, the entire amount is set aside uh, by law for the purposes of funding hygiene and clean, in, clean India initiatives. So this already shows us not just that the nature of earmarking is quite diverse, but also that the legal issues are plenty. In the Austrian case, as the news piece highlights, there is this issue of state aid, which is also a part of the thesis that I will be writing eventually. And the Indian situation shows us monies are not being spent. So this is just to highlight and start the conversation on earmarking. So as I said, earmarking is prevalent in developed and developing countries. I've already looked at uh, Australia, India, and the US. Um, in the US also, we do see earmarking, but it happens at the state level. As per reports that I've come across, about 27% of state budgets come from earmarked tax resources. So unlike India, where about 10% of the federal tax revenues are coming from earmarked taxes. Australia does have earmarked taxes, but they've been lesser and they've been more short term and more specific. These are examples that I will again give you through the course of the next few slides. But why is it relevant today for us to talk about earmarking? Well, today we are at the brink of another economic downturn. Governments are going to be looking at ways of raising funds. Governments are looking at ways of creating more trust and creating a system where tax compliance can be you know, ushered in. And in a post-COVID era, we may be looking at raising funds for health and environment-related causes. So this may be an issue, and this may be a policy tool that is implemented by governments. So this makes it even more relevant. Uh, in the past, economists have debated, public finance theorists have debated about the pros and cons of earmarking. But I think it's also time to say that earmarking is happening, and then we move on to examine the actual legal issues therefrom. But it's not just that I see earmarking happening in the case of social purpose levies. Uh, the Austrian example is really a illustration of the fact that digital taxes may also at some point take this kind of form wherein to kind of co-opt different players, they may have earmarking to benefit a certain sector. And whether or not this will stand the test of time, whether or not this will stand the test of law is one that we have to look at. At the European level, we have issues like EU state aid. Uh, at international level, we may have different issues that we want to look at. So this is the introduction to the fact that this is a relevant issue that needs, in fact, to be studied from a legal perspective. Um, earmarking, in a very simple way, the IBFD tax glossary, I think, is a good starting point. It is basically the raising of revenue for, 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 from a particular tax source or a particular revenue source for a particular public expenditure. This is a simple definition that I think everyone's usually able to follow. Uh, economic uh, studies are there. Public finance studies are very much abundant in this area. There are also a few legal studies, typically in the context of domestic tax systems. 
uh, emerging studies in the US on this field come from Professor Susanna Kamiktak, and she has studied the US system, where she in fact says earmarking signifies a spending promise of the government. Uh, earmarking is also synonymous with hypothecation. This instead may be a term that some of us have heard, but earmarking and hypothecation are similar. Again, if you look at the IBFT tax glossary, you see the validation on this. Earmarking discussed in this paper, though, is um, to be therefore understood as earmarking the act of raising revenues from a particular source for a particular public expenditure. James Buchanan, who is uh, the famous economist who reinvigorated the discussion on earmark taxes, also spoke about special fiscal purpose units that serve similar purposes as earmarking, like school districts and fire districts. But we're not talking about something like that, for example. And also what we're not uh, talking about is just the act of allocating budgetary revenues to particular uh, purposes. What we're looking at is tagging a particular tax source to a particular purpose, right? It happens very often that uh, budgets put aside, say, 10% for a particular purpose, 15% for another particular purpose. But we're not talking about generic allocation from uh, budgetary funds. What we're looking at is tagging of uh, revenue sources and particular public expenditures. Now we come to the fact that we have literature on this. But I think what's not really been done is this kind of comprehensive study. And I think this um, matrix that I have is only going to expand with time, you know, because this is, I would say, a preliminary thing that I've done in terms of mapping the different kinds of earmarked measures that there are. What I have out here is seven. In fact, I've combined two points, so a total of eight different facets of earmarking, as I would like to, you know, point our attention to. The first we can start is with the middle bubble, which is legal basis and oversight. So the legal basis of earmarking can be quite varied. It could be just a statute that enacts earmark taxes. We've seen this very much in India. I use the example of the Tobacco Cess Act in India, which came out in 1975. It was a levy on Virginia grade tobacco, and it was on the manufacture of this kind of tobacco. Produce, uh, paid by the producers, and it was earmarked for the benefit of the tobacco industry. On the other hand, you also have earmarking that emanates directly from the Constitution. And an example for this I again found from the US, where you have lottery proceeds being uh, put aside for like an environmental trust fund. So I'll come back to the trust fund point as well. And what is oversight? So sometimes what happens is that earmarking is kept aside in such a manner that the utilization of the money then does not need to go through parliamentary process or the process of appropriation, if you're familiar with that word. While this may be the case in some instances, in India, by and large, the money goes into the Consolidated Fund of India. And that money, each time that you seek to withdraw from, you need to pass an appropriation bill. While I would like to add over here that there is this interesting confusion or diversity in practice even in India. And this is exactly what's making headlines now, that some of our earmark taxes are maintained in the Consolidated Fund of India, but the others are in this different account called the public account. This reminds me, in fact, of the US trust funds where the government is supposed to be acting as a banker. And so the government uh, gets away by saying that if the money is in the public account, it need not go through a separate appropriation process. But I believe that all tax revenues, including earmark tax monies, should in fact be in the Consolidated Fund of India. But there is this interesting contradiction in practice, even in the Indian context. Looking at the second point on sub-funds, when we say monies are earmarked, what does this actually mean? Is it that it's going into this one big bucket of resources? Or is it that it is being categorized into sub-funds? And this is really a mystery in the Indian case, because when I had studied the 40 odd uh, Indian earmark taxes, in practice, we saw that sub funds were created only for about 15. So we don't really know how it is that they are earmarking this. Do they just create an accounting code? Or do they actually take the uh, effort of creating a sub fund, which can then be tracked down to increase uh, transparency of process? And so it may be that they are kept 
entirely in the consolidated fund. It could be that they're kept in sub funds in the consolidated fund in the Indian context. In the US context, what I've understood is that earmarking is done within trust funds, which are therefore what I said sounds to me similar to the Indian context of a public account. Okay, so this was a bit of the diversity on practice, but there's more to come. The third is partial or full. And this is interesting. If all of us think about it, um, a lot of the times we think we're paying for this earmark tax and we say, great, you know, we're putting all our money together and supporting this cause of hygiene or education or health. But in practice, a lot of the times this money is supplemented by normal budgetary funds. In that sense, then you would call it partial earmarking. And this is referred to by Robert Carling as soft earmarking, because it's still, you know, a front for the fact that some money comes from the so-called earmarked levy, but a lot more may just come again from budget. So it does not do away with the need in some cases to go back or to fall back upon the budgetary funds. Full earmarking is when we know that we only raise money from this particular earmark and the whole purpose is financed from that. So there are ample examples of different kinds in practice. Uh, the fourth one is time. So the time for which a levy's earmark could be either short or long. An example or multiple examples of short-term earmarked levies come from Australia. And these are very specific levies that were enforced for a year or two years with very specific purposes. And it appears that the purpose was fulfilled and the levy was taken back. For example, there was a gun buyback levy in Australia. They had this one-time levy for about a year and then they rolled it back. I think this was 1980s, if I remember. An ANSET levy was about rescuing or helping uh, this airline, which was undergoing financial distress. And so this was also levied for two years and every time people bought tickets, they paid this and it was rolled back in two years. But there is also evidence of long-term earmarking, maybe because of the purposes. And the example that I discuss here is the one that I discuss later on in the Indian context, which is the education cess in India. We've been paying this levy now for quite many years, easily two decades. And this is an example of long-term earmarking. And this is one of the most popular uh, earmarking uh, examples from India. And I think it's nowhere to go there for. So it's a long-term uh, earmarking example. The fifth is choice of base. As we as tax lawyers would also wonder, is earmarking happening by way of a direct tax, indirect tax? What kind of taxes are they doing this on? The Indian scenario showed us that it was mostly done on indirect taxes. So there is a bit of a constitutional history to that. I won't get into that today. Uh, but again, this could be direct or indirect tax, but that's going one step ahead, right? The other step is, is this a tax or a fee? And that's something that again, we need to think about and I'm coming to that. Um, the sixth aspect is which government is levying these uh, kinds of levies, to use the more neutral word. And this could be anything like the US, it could be a subnational government, like India, it could be the federal government. But taking that a little further and giving you some more information, think about this. In India, we are a federal government. Um, hygiene is not something that is a central subject or a federal subject, meaning that hygiene is in fact the responsibility of the state government. So what's happening here is that the federal government is levying a hygiene tax is collecting the money, not giving it to the state governments on the pretext of the constitutional exception. But then again, they do admit in all the documents that this is a state subject, we have to share it with the states. So what do they do? They share it at their own discretion. Who are they bypassing? The constitutional body, the Finance Commission, which was set up in place to be an independent, unbiased body for vertical and horizontal distribution of tax revenues. So this fiscal federalism angle is actually something I've noticed in India and maybe something one notices in other federal governments as well. Um, at the EU level, again, because you don't have EU level levies, what you see is member states having different kinds of uh, earmark taxes. The EU terminology is parafiscal levies or parafiscal taxes. These are basically industry or business specific taxes that are usually given back or are benefiting that particular industry, at least in part. This is what is by the definition. 
Um, and I think the last is actually the most interesting, which is what I hinted at when I was introducing Austrian digital services tax. The nexus that I refer to is between the payers and the beneficiaries. And I broadly say that it could be of three kinds. The first could be that the contributors are in fact the beneficiaries, right? That all of us pay a toll tax. We are the contributors and we are the beneficiaries because all this money is actually going into the upkeep of the highway, say. And say there is a good correlation of actual utilization and somehow we pay pro rata, you know, in terms of a small user versus a big user, assume all that. On the other hand, could be an example like the education says. The whole of India, in, in the case of education says, all income earners actually pay the education says. It's a small percentage, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, this is the range of it. And who are the beneficiaries of it? Everyone desirous of using the public infrastructure of education. But the third is therefore the most interesting, the Austrian Digital Services Tax. It is the large MNCs that are actually the tax subjects of something like an Austrian Digital Services Tax. Why do we say that? If you go back and look at the Austrian Digital Services Tax Act, the thresholds for tax liability of the 5% DSP are 750 million revenue worldwide and I think 25 million revenue at the national level. These are going to be the big players. But who is it that is going to potentially benefit from the earmarking of the 15 million revenues? The local Austrian media companies. So you are actually having the large MNCs of the US potentially paying up to benefit the competitors. So as I said, this may be a gamut of legal issues and therefore I think quite exciting a study. And this is, as I said, an introductory mapping of the fact that earmarking exists and it exists in various forms. So this is somewhat our introduction of the what and the how aspects of earmarking, but the why and the why not. And this has been debated and even before I speak, you might see that some things appear on the why and the why not side, which is a funny thing, right? Like the why is, one of the whys is, it applies the benefit theory. And the why not is, it does not really apply the benefit theory. On one side, you see people saying, it may improve tax compliance, but they also say it restricts legislative oversight. So from the fact that I have done all of this mapping, one realizes that so-called merits and demerits discussed in literature until now also depend very much on the actual design features of an earmarked levy. So for some countries, some of these pros may actually not make sense, and some of the cons may be the prominent problems. Um, just to talk about a few of the other things that I haven't already said, one of the important features of uh, earmarking being considered in a positive light is the fact that it may improve tax compliance. And this was always my intuitive gut feeling, honestly, but I did find an empirical study on this. So Professor Joseph Hunsdorfer, who's a professor at Free University Berlin, actually did a whole uh, empirical study comparing labeling and earmarking. So let's just take a moment to see what is labeling then. Uh, as we said, earmarking is putting aside money for specific purposes. Labeling is just using a name to signal that it does something while it does not do anything more than that. For example, in the study, they used labeling uh, as a levy called as education surcharge. So it gives you the feeling that it's actually contributing towards education, but it does not do anything further as for the study parameters. Earmarking was on the other hand, a so-called neutral terminology, but um, in this case called as income tax surcharge, but it was actually earmarked for education. And then they had a third category, which was doing both the labeling and earmarking elements, which was an education surcharge. So you see the fact that it is earmarked and you also know that it is labeled towards education. Interestingly, what they found was uh, earmarking has the strongest positive connection with tax compliance. And once you earmark, labeling doesn't really improve this very significantly. So labeling is in fact not the best solution. Earmarking is the better one. And once you've earmarked, whether you label or not doesn't really add uh, immense value to it. While 
I must admit, I always thought labeling and earmarking together would be strong because of just the way it has happened in India in all these years. I've always seen education stress have a recall value. I've always seen hygiene stress have a recall value. But of course, it was an empirical study and they themselves said that this was more of a short term study and that uh, the impact on tax compliance may really be different in the long term where in, if there are evidences of the fact that governments haven't spent the money for desired purposes, the Indian situation, for example. So whether or not tax compliance can really be ushered in also is a question of the way it's really implemented. Uh, the other positive uh, things about earmarking is that it aids in making informed decisions for policymakers as well as people advising the government. Uh, the why not is that it can also outlive its purpose, right? Who is to say if education has been funded enough in 20 years, whether it should continue more or not. Uh, the other problem could be misallocation of resources. The prerogative of the government setting out already an estimated amount of money, which may or may not be needed at the end of the day, is one of the problems with the way earmarking is designed. So there is the why and the why not, but I think we also have to move a bit ahead of this and admit to the fact that it does exist. And therefore, to ask what are not just the domestic issues on these uh, earmark taxes, but what are increasingly the international issues related to these uh, taxes. Uh, so I did use the word tax, but I have to take that step back again and ask whether these kinds of levies are actually taxes or fees. And I admit that the way I use tax and fee is Perhaps how all of you understand it, but also may not be, because, for example, the French concept of tax is actually the French con is equal is usually the international concept of an earmark tax. They use tax as a special tax earmarked for a purpose. So we do understand that nomenclature may be different. Possibly Canada and India again being somewhat more aligned on this concept. Maybe we all follow this more easily. But as is the most introductory definition of tax for all of us, it's a compulsory payment for augmenting government's resources paid to the government without the expectation of a quid pro quo. And the fee, on the other hand, has this ability of, you know, furnishing a service, a particular service which is identifiable to a particular recipient. Uh, the examples are known to all of us, so let's move on to see why this is interesting. And this is where I would like to highlight a table from William McCleary, who is a World Bank economist, and this is the paper he'd written in 1991. And for all of us as tax lawyers and researchers, the first thing that we possibly see is tax of fees bunched up. Bunched up in what he calls as type A as well as type B. But let's first see the context in which this whole table was given in his study. So he was trying to discern the policy goal of different earmarked measures. And he put them into three goals. And he said, only the first type will have the earmarking goal, while types B, C, and D are more about redistribution and social justice. Why did he think so? Because he said, if you have a specific tax or a fee, which is dedicated to a specific end use, it looks like strong earmarking. But again, we may, as tax lawyers, have different thoughts on this, and I'll come to that. And then he said every other combination, and there are three further combinations, specific tax with a broad end use, or a general tax with a specific end use, general tax with a broad end use, all of these pursue different goals of redistribution and social welfare. Before we think a bit about uh, these goals and strong versus weaker, the first thing I think we all notice is type A or B could be a tax or a fee. And someone like this, who is an economist, does not further look at the legal categorization, right? For him, it is okay, it could be a tax or a fee. And he further clarifies that um, while it is true that the earmarking is strongest if it takes the form of fee, because the contributors and the beneficiaries are overlapping, Benefit taxation can exist independent of earmarking, meaning that earmarking can in fact be by virtue of a narrow tax applied for a narrow purpose. But the point is, is it that a narrow tax with a narrow purpose always assumes just an earmarking goal? And possibly not, because I was thinking about the Indian context here. And 
I thought of this mineral levy, which was on a particular mining industry, which is the limestone industry. It was payable by the owners of the mines and the money was to be earmarked for the benefit of laborers in that particular mining industry. So what you start seeing is owners paying for workers. This becomes closer to redistribution. So, and why do I say narrow again? Let's justify because in the Indian context, you have a much broader based levy such as the education cess, which is paid by all income earners and is tagged for creating education infrastructure across the country. So in relative terms, something like the limestone earmarked levy in the Indian context is a befitting example of a narrow tax with a narrow purpose and narrow enough because the legislation is very detailed. It says that this is for housing purposes, hospital purposes, et cetera, et cetera. Far more detailed than the hygiene says, which only says promoting and financing the Clean India Initiative. Just one open-ended line in one finance act, which was passed without much parliament discussion, unfortunately. So these were older legislations which came with detailed objectives. And so this was an example of a narrow purpose and a narrow tax. But again, it's not always going to be possibly earmarking. There could be other goals. And so this is one of the first few discoveries as a tax lawyer looking at all of this literature. But then the other thing uh, I think that needs to be thought about more and comes out in the case law that I'll discuss is how different is an earmark tax from a regulatory tax? There is a purpose. Does it go one step further by pledging the funds for that purpose? as opposed to just being a regulatory tax, which is a Pigouvian tax for uh, modifying certain behavior that is considered having negative externality, right? So this is kind of setting out the context. And on the right-hand side, just wanting to show that can we think of earmarking then as a spectrum? The first or the, uh, the one end of it being just allocations from budget, which is not strictly tax earmarking. The other end being fees. Then the point is, are fees inherently earmarked? Because they are for a public purpose, right? They have to be kept aside for that purpose. And then to say that at the center of all of this then are earmarked taxes, which have the attribute of earmarking, but don't promise a quid pro quo. And thesis and this paper is really talking then about legal issues emanating from earmarked taxes, which exhibit both features of earmarking, but do not uh, have any quid pro quo, if anything, that would only be incidental. I hope we're doing well in terms of time. Yeah, we're coming to now the international tax issue. And this is for all tax lawyers, uh, squarely an article two issue, but for the students in our class, just a bit of a background, uh, article two of the OECD model convention sets out the material scope of tax treaties, right? It tells us which are actually the taxes covered, which are the ones that give taxpayers entitlement or tax treaty protection. And the general scheme is that it is taxes on income, taxes on capital, and that Article 2, Para 3 says that contracting states agree upon a list of taxes covered, which are taxes in force at the time of the entering of the treaty. And Article 2, Para 4, which says subsequent similar taxes should also in principle be covered. All of this plays out in the discussion and interesting nuances from case law across the globe. Um, so the questions are, therefore, are earmarked taxes, earmarked fees, or if it's an oxymoron, just fees, really covered within tax treaties. And Working Party 30 in 1969 had said that social security funds are not meant to be covered. These are levies that exhibit direct connection and not covered in tax treaties. Then can we also ask the question whether earmarking means that these are still imposed on behalf of a contracting state, right? Because some people say if it's earmarked, is it any longer imposed on behalf because it's kind of promised or pledged away? The idea is that the legal basis for earmarking still comes from a statute or the constitution, right? So it is still imposed on behalf or with the sanction of the government. The only other point though here, which has also got me thinking is, if these funds are maintained outside of the budget, what does that mean? I have seen instances of extra budgetary funds. And uh, I mean, I've seen more of this discussion in IMF reports, but I'm not entirely sure again of earmarked taxes, which are maintained in extra budgetary funds. But if any of you have, I'm all ears to learn of more examples. 
Um, the third aspect here is while Article 2 says the levies could be by, by taxes could be by a contracting state, political subdivisions or authorities, that means potentially local earmark taxes can be covered. But those of us who've seen the US uh, tax treaty network know that only recently they have started introducing Article 2.1 and 2.2, but even otherwise, it's a federal state that does not extend the tax treaty protection to, uh, to subnational levies. So again, these are things that we have to be aware of. Um, more, more importantly, though, for the purposes of the cases that I study and for understanding the application of Article 2, we have to always ask whether the earmark tax, after having proved that it is a tax, tax on income, whether it is existing or subsequent, because then we see which of the tests in Article 2 is actually to be applied by the courts. Before we get to this case law, which is definitely interesting, you may have thought who would have asked the question about earmarking, but it indeed was asked. So the US delegation in the Working Party 30 1969 report actually asked the question whether earmark taxes are covered in tax treaties. And possibly this is because they always had earmarking as a prominent feature. And the Working Party replies very categorically, immaterial, the purpose is immaterial. Therefore, as long as it is a tax on income, it is something that should be covered in the tax treaty network. But they also say, you know, that the general description on Article 2.1 and 2.2 makes this very clear. And sometimes then in actual application, we have situations where countries depart from the OECD model convention and just go for the exhaustive list equivalent uh, under Article 2, Para 3 alternative formulation in the OECD commentary and with the 2.4. Then what happens? So um, this is something that could be a potential issue. But also when they gave this uh, categorical statement that immaterial, the purpose is immaterial, they actually use the example of Austria and they talk about a 1966 levy, which was more like uh, on uh, emergency related issues to be able to fund emergency or natural catastrophes. And they said this was a tax actually on income and therefore the fact that it is uh, temporary, uh, extraordinary, earmarked does not matter. So this is just the context of the fact of some intention at the time of the OECD model convention being drafted. Uh, and they in fact said that there are various reasons for retaining Article 2, Para 1, 2, because a lot of countries, including the US, said this language is so vague, what is a tax on income? It is going to be very difficult to interpret. But the Working Party 30, having thought of all this, said there are several reasons why we need to retain. And one of the reasons was controversies around earmark taxes and their coverage can be avoided because these are taxes on income. It kind of brings back the focus to the fact that tax treaties were for taxes on income and therefore an earmarked purpose shouldn't come in the way. And this is therefore the two instances where they talk about uh, and therefore conclude, despite objections in the initial phase, of whether 2122 should be retained, they ultimately go to the uh, present model, which is 212223 and 24. Um, so now what are the tests? Um, so if it is an existing tax, one would assume that Article 2, Paragraph 3, which is the list of taxes covered, would usually have all taxes. And it should, if it is in the intention of the governments or the contracting states, that any earmarked taxes would be included. One example that I did find in the Indian Tax Treaty Network, and this is the only one, is the tax treaty between India and Poland, which actually includes earmarked taxes levied under the Income Tax Act. Um, the list itself in Article 2, Para 3 has an amplifying effect, meaning if something is mentioned there, we don't then go and investigate whether it's a tax on income or tax on capital. But does that mean we could just put an earmarked fee also in Article 2, Para 3? And the answer to this comes from the OECD commentary where they say, you know, the list is only meant for taxes. It's not meant for social security charges. It's clearly there, I think, in Para 6 of the OECD commentary on Article 2. So while the Article 2, Para 3 allows the countries to put any kinds of taxes, including earmarked taxes, it seems that they cannot go to the extent of earmarked fees or fees to that effect. Then the other thing that you can do is in a situation where an existing tax is actually omitted. And Professor Lang has argued that, uh, well, if it is omitted, it may only be read in or it may be permitted to make a case for inclusion 
if it is a minor tax that collects little revenue. And while we may not always have ample examples of minor taxes that collect revenue, maybe possibly at some stage someone would use this argument for an earmark tax because it could be a small levy. But again, theoretically, because we don't have examples of this argument really being made. But on the other hand, a lot of other people have said, if an existing tax is not included, the intention is to exclude. Because this is the whole point of treaty negotiation and of agreeing upon a list of taxes covered. What about a subsequent tax? So for a subsequent tax, if Article 2.1 and 2.2 have in fact been included, you could go back to the general definition, but then you make your case through all these uh, steps. It is a tax, it is a tax on income, it is a tax on capital otherwise, and that it is something that can be read into 2.1.2.2, right? Um, again, can we say that earmark taxes are covered within 2.1.2.2? Apart from points we already made on the historical deliberation, an interesting inclusion in the deemed reference in Article 2, Paragraph 2 is payroll taxes or taxes on total amount of wages paid by enterprises. These are typically earmarked, right? And this was never an objection. The only objection raised with respect to payroll taxes and the historical deliberation was that this may be confusing. Is this a social security charge or a payroll tax? And therefore, the commentary clarifies that uh, social security charges having a direct connection do not amount to taxes on total amount of wages paid by enterprises. So again, earmarking was not the concern with even a payroll tax. You may, at the very last resort, also think of earmark taxes and as an accessory to a principal duty. And this is, again, another nuance in the various features of earmark taxes. So they may be standalone, but they may also just be an add-on to an existing tax. Like the education cess in India is an add-on to income tax liability, right? And the clean India cess was an add-on to taxable services, uh, to service tax. So there could be various kinds and in one or two instances, you may then argue that they're covered because they're accessory to a principal duty. On the other hand, if you have Article 2, Para 4, your other fallback is to say this is a subsequent levy, but it is substantially similar to an already covered tax and that earmarking should not transform the nature of the levy. Studies by authors on the two para four test have said that the main criteria tax, a base and tax object, it's not really earmarking. So while the working party 30s did say that earmarking uh, is, uh, earmark taxes are covered and more securely covered because of inclusion of 2.1 and 2.2, other academic uh, authors and writing on 2 para 4 seem to think that earmarking should not weigh when you compare taxes. But is this really borne out? And that's why the case study is interesting. So looking at cases on earmark taxes or fees, I could find three of them. So there's not as much case law on this, but if there's something I missed and you know of, please again, let me know. I've looked at cases from Australia, Sweden, and India. So I'll start with the Swedish temporary tax on profit distributions. And why these three cases are actually interesting is they actually highlight the various problems with the lack of sometimes theoretical understanding or clarity on either Article 2 or just the concept of earmarking. Now, in this case, this is a temporary tax on profit distributions levied only for a year, 1983 in Sweden. But there is this lack of understanding as to whether this tax is actually earmarked or extraordinary or both. Why so? Because the lower court thinks of it as an extraordinary tax. The Supreme Administrative Court says it has all these facets and therefore it's not substantially similar to an income tax. Academic opinion on description of this case is divided. Patricia Van Stender says it's an extraordinary tax. An extraordinary tax cannot be earmarked, while other authors, as I've said in the paper, have said this is earmarked. So what is it that we have to really identify to say that something is not just extraordinary, but also earmarked? We have to be able to identify what the purpose for the funds was. And this is exactly where the facts, even from the IBFD translated version, is not super clear. It, it tells us that the money goes into a special fund. It tells us that there was a reason that is to disincentivize tax uh, profit distribution and therefore this activity was taxed but it really doesn't tell us what was being done with the money. And therefore I think there is this confusion. And why is this important? If it is only an earmark tax, historical deliberations told us it shouldn't matter. I haven't talked about this, but even extraordinary taxes were discussed. 
And Sweden was in fact the country that said in its uh, draft model uh, uh, version of Article 2 that extraordinary taxes should be included. But eventually the OECD commentary has this kind of confusing language which says earmark extraordinary taxes were not meant to be excluded, but they could be excluded by virtue of specific consent. But if both features are combined, then it looks that it may be tougher to argue for inclusion of earmark taxes. And it may very well be the case that a lot of earmark taxes are extraordinary. Think of the Australian examples, ANSET ticket levy or gun buy back. They may have different tax bases, but just drawing upon the nature of extraordinary short term levies, this may be an issue then that you don't end up getting tax treaty protection because of this kind of twin uh, facets. The other one is the Irish pay related social insurance. Uh, this was an issue of the classic tax versus fee debate. This was an amount paid by employees and self-employed persons, but they found that there was a direct connection between the contribution and the benefits being derived. There was a special fund the money was going into and the court said you cannot say that these are uh, taxes, these look more like fees and not covered. So this is slightly more straightforward. But of course, personally, and also I think you would agree, the most interesting is the Indian case. Why so? Because, the, um, and this is the one case that is referred to everywhere as a source to say that earmark taxes are covered in tax treaties. So if you look at the Vogel commentary, there is um, the reference to a tribunal judgment from India, and this is the one that I'm dissecting. Uh, this comes from Calcutta, which is uh, one of the states in the country. Uh, the tribunal said the tax treaties cover education sets. But let's look back as to the reasoning and whether that holds water. The India-Singapore tax treaty was entered into in 1994. The education test comes in a few years later. And the Indian tax treaty in this case uh, did not have Article 2.1 and 2.2 equivalent language. So it only had an exhaustive list of existing taxes and two para four equivalent language to say subsequent similar taxes will be covered. But what did the tribunal say? It said that the cess is covered because it is a surcharge, but why did they even have this kind of reasoning? Because the exhaustive list of taxes covered says income tax, including any surcharge thereon. What's the catch? If education cess was introduced years after the so-called existing list of taxes covered, you couldn't have read it into that. You should have done a substantive analysis of the fact that it is substantially similar to an income tax. And therefore, unfortunately, this was a missed opportunity for the Indian tribunal to say that the education says is covered, but possibly with completely different reasoning. But to have done that, they should have actually proved that the constitutional difference between a cess and a surcharge, which is one of the things that I've written about, does not actually matter from a tax treaty perspective. But unfortunately, they do none of that. They rely on the so-called reading of an exhaustive list of taxes covered by just saying assess is a surcharge. In simple words, assess in the Indian context is an earmark tax, while a surcharge is just a tax on tax for any purpose. So why do they even do that? That is again because of some drafting problems. The Indian charging legislation for the earmark tax, that is the education says, actually describes it as a cess, which is a surcharge for the purposes of financing education. So that's a plethora of problems there, but you see the tribunal also falling to this trap that cess is surcharged and covered by virtue of an exhaustive list of taxes covered. So what's the anomaly in the reasoning here? It's a subsequent earmark tax that has been up, this tribunal decision has been upheld by various other tribunals, all of which having similar cases of different tax treaties. This is the one with Singapore, but similar situations with other countries, all subsequent taxes just being held as included because of this. So the ultimate conclusion may not change, but the reasoning is a problem here. And this is a missed opportunity for not having taken the substantive analysis on board. And uh, therefore, this also brings me to the conclusion, which is that Earmarking is, in fact, a very interdisciplinary area. Public finance, economics, and tax law literature have an opportunity to come together. And what are the questions we see in a tax treaty context? The very basic fundamental questions of whether something that is an earmarked levy remains to be a tax. Is it in the domain of a fee? Does it lead to any implications from an Article 2 perspective? Earmark tax has to sometimes be distinguished from extraordinary tax 
but I wouldn't say that they cannot overlap, right? An earmark tax could also be extraordinary in nature. But then again, to think of whether earmark taxes and regulatory taxes are similar or not is another interesting aspect. Uh, what is the stock of case law telling us at this point of time? Theoretically, sometimes aspects are still unclear. Practically, aspects on Article 2 application, which is not just an issue with earmark taxes, but more stark in the context of the Indian education says and the earmark taxes analysis shows that substantive findings are still eluding. And the whole first part of the discussion shows us that earmarking comes in various shapes and forms. And for tax lawyers, I think promises a lot of interesting legal issues, just one of which is the tax treaty analysis. So I think this is almost in time, hopefully, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And I'd very, very, uh, be, I'd be very happy to take any comments, answer any questions, also appreciate any comments um, or thought bubbles and see where we can take it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this this wonderful presentation. It's uh, it's a very interesting and and certainly under understudy topic. I just want to uh, invite everyone for a virtual round of applause. Uh, I know that in Vienna we don't we don't actually applaud. We we knock on a desk, but here we're going to do a, a virtual applause to Shida for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much.